Welcome everyone to the 98th episode of the New Gen Mindset Podcast. I'm here with Nick Tartaglia and I'm Dan Kozal. We tried to mix it up here today. What's going on, man? Good. Well, first off, it's the first day of snow and it's the first day of in-studio podcast. So it's kind of like an odd, you know, little uh, situation going on at the same time. But um, wait, hold on. Why is it odd? I don't know. Just the snow. Like we, we say last <laughs> time, we always talk about weather, but it's just odd that like ironically, Weather's always turning as the world's kind of turning. So just yesterday, you know, for example, you heard how the United States had a drone attack in Yemen that did another second round of attacks in Syria. And then today we got snow. I don't know, just, you know, things always seem to be turning as the weather's turning. I think it's a combination of all the chaos that's been happening all over the world, right? Um, we know it's happening. Um, it's very difficult not to pay attention to it. But amidst all this chaos, there's... A tremendous amount of opportunity. And the key is to understand what the chaos is so you can understand where the opportunity lays. So that's the key. It's really understanding what's happening around the world. Yeah. Observing the global conditions, analyzing it, understanding it. And then by understanding those those moves, you can understand where to stand on an opposing side to make sure you take an advantage of that chaos. So I, I, think, I think what's really happened right now globally is... Um, this is all a battle between natural resources, ultimately. Um, you've got people fighting for oil and gas reserves globally. Commodities. And, 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 and you've got sort of this narrative on both sides pushing for some form of peace in the world. But I don't think you can have any form of peace at this point in time. Especially when it's driven by government and you have trust declining. Yeah, exactly. And... The other thing, too, is government spending has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, but, again, this is our first in-studio podcast. We're so excited if you're listening. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're really going to do a deep dive into the next six to eight months on our thesis of where we think, you know, the opportunities are um, because that's really all you can focus on. I know that, you know, it's chaotic. People are getting absolutely exactly. slaughtered. It's it's really unfortunate. But we really want to go kind of break it down and kind of observe, or not necessarily observe, but discuss the, the the global macro conditions to kind of lay where opportunities exist for you guys and the, yeah. the opportunities that we ourselves are taking advantage I of. Exactly. Uh, and so and, and I was just gonna say, I actually bought some crypto this morning. So <laughs> <laughs> so just to just to start off a little bit from a geopolitical standpoint, because I know everybody's paying attention to what's happening, obviously in the Middle East, but understand the ripple effect of the Middle East. So obviously you have to understand is that the Israel-Palestine, you obviously have Israel kind of like as a proxy for America. Um, then you have to understand that the Palestine is not just Palestine uh, alone. You have the Middle East. So you have to take into account Syria, Yemen, Iran. So the, this is more of a collective battle, not just one specific nation Correct. versus the West. So that's one. Then you have the, the second condition, or the second thing is what happened, uh, was it last year, uh, two years ago, with the Ukraine and Russia. Again, Russia. and that war is ending, by the way. Exactly, because right? they can't—they can't afford to fund it. No, they can't. But the thing is, at the same time, is you might see them remain liquid just to make sure that they have to. But the attention has shifted to the Middle East right now because that's where the primary condition. You have Ukraine uh, and the West and America that's validated that they've, they've reached a standhold with Russia, and it's been difficult to kind of move somewhere. So clearly, their outlook on the war has been horribly wrong. But that's just like almost all government can. Um, expectations. So you have Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine being kind of the proxy for the West. Uh, then you have to take into account that just the other day, again, uh, Blinken, the uh, Secretary so official, of State, exactly, yeah, the, the State. official for America just officially uh, went to South Korea to kind of show American support for South Korea in the rise of North Korean kind of activity, military activity. Again, South Korea being the proxy for the West. Uh, you have China, Taiwan. Again, Taiwan is more had to do with semiconductors and the ability to kind of uh, electrify By the By the way, big, I, I just want people to understand the implications of this. Taiwan is the biggest supplier of semiconductors in the world. So every iPhone that every TikTok influencer is using right now, if we have a, tr if we have a problem in Taiwan where China goes in and invades that country, there's a massive... There's a massive issue on on the supply and chain. It's on not that side just too. that alone. Yeah. You could also ripple that out to the uh, to the eastern control of a ton of different commodities and rare earth metals. Correct. Because over the last decade, or far over a decade, you've come. The West has completely neglected their own domestic supply because they've kind of just you know allowed the East to do it and supply them for well, cheap. China. Price. Exactly, China. you know, China, Russia, and Africa. Yeah. Um, so you have that. Then you also have uh, Africa. So obviously Taiwan being again the proxy for the West. Um, and you have Africa and Europe. 
again, Europe being from the West and Africa kind of being, you, for example, just happened a couple months ago was you saw Africa, a couple places, starting to kick out uh, European forces. The French, for example, they're starting to limit the control, uh, start at least control more the uranium and gold supply that they have a ton of, of in Africa. And uh, because they've been u- m- like kind of like manipulated and used well, I, I, think, I think that that's also again we're we're, we're just painting a picture exactly. for you so guys. So this is more of a geopolitical so conflict it, dilemma. Yeah, this this is what is happening right now, and like we're we're going to do is we're going to tie it to what we're seeing on the on, on on the finance side. But the other thing that you talked about, which was uh, very important, is critical elements. Exactly. Um, China has control of pretty much everything right now, and exactly. if. Canada, the U.S., any of the Western countries want any chance of securing national security and having a strong supply chain, you need to have access to critical elements here. And for whatever reason, the West has been reluctant to pursue exactly. additional mining just projects. To, just to add to that and validate that, as you saw a couple months ago where China... Um, as you can tell, Nick's very excited. But go <laughs> ahead, Nick. China, China literally came out limiting their export of two specific critical metals purposely to know because they have control of it. Yeah. Uh, they also announced just last week uh, the same thing they did with graphite. Um, and then, for example, just to give you another two type of commodities that we closely kind of know is tungsten and vanadium. These are two critical metals that ni- 85 to 90 percent of it, this is just one little example. What, of hold on, hold on. For the, for the listeners, what is tungsten and what is vanadium? Because I think we know so, it, but I just, so tungsten let's, is let's explain it. more uh, critically used in military tools and weapons. So it's kind of from that standpoint. And vanadium is more also closely related to batteries and electrification. But not just any type of batteries. These are batteries that are like for storage. It's very complicated science, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. So it's just to give a little, just to give a little example. But so these are 85 to 90% controlled by Russia, China, and Africa. So just understanding this dynamic while you know that the Western forces like Europe and, and North America, they heavily want to go into this green initiative and electrification. But the condition is you have to understand is the primary input to this dream, this fantasy that the, you know the, the political people and these academics and this government people want is you need the primary input of commodities, but we don't have any domestically. So by default, we become dependent on the external forces and these external forces are now kind of like using proxy battles with, so you have this East and West while you're trying to electrify, but you need, you need these other nations. And you've got and you've got wars that are being funded. So, so you know, so this is just from a geopolitical and a commodity standpoint, things are escalating there. Yeah, exactly. And um, the other thing too, and I think that I mean we've talked about this so many times. China has basically established uh, an industrial belt in Africa where they've given these African countries a significant amount of loans uh, and exactly. said, You don't have to pay us back, but give us access to your supply chain. So and it's all tied in with Africa kicking it, out Europe. It, exactly. So, you know, the Africans are with the Chinese, like most of those countries. Um, the West is, honestly, I just hate to say it, the West is literally collapsing as mm-hmm. we speak. And now to tie this into what we're going to get to later also is just to take into this account. Historically, from a standpoint, if you're going to now incur geopolitical risk and you're going you know, going to these type of conflicts where America is seeing is being divided between, let's say, all these different nations that are using as proxies, Correct. liquidity is important. If you have no liquidity, you can't pay your forces and you can't expand your forces and you can't take your forces head on. So liquidity is key. And remember, throughout history, you tend to get these inflationary or depressions that occur as a byproduct of conflict and geopolitical risk. So this is key to understand right now. Yeah. um, You know, you hit the nail on the head there, Nick, with um, inflation because um, unfortunately it's making a comeback. Um, Everybody who thought that inflation was just going to disappear. I mean, we're going to have high prices for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this is coupled with the way the jobs market functions, how jobs data is published. Jobs data is a lagging indicator, unfortunately, although you do have, you know, the expected jobless claims, which is leading into it. But these are all historical data points that these so-called academics, Mm -hmm. these PhDs that are running the Fed, they're using it, and it's totally disconnected from what's happening in reality, right? Exactly. So now give context to the unemployment. So just so that people understand why employment is um, important to understand. It's not because we want it to be important. It's because from a central standpoint, the way the Fed talks. I and mean, this is how policies function. Exactly. This is so why rates are moving. policies and stuff like that. So the way central banks operate is they're given, well, at least in the West and in Europe, they're given two mandates typically, employment and inflation. So... A lot of times what they'll say is, well, like, for example, when we thought we had inf- uh, a recession last year, the central bank and the uh, economic academics, they came out, we said, well, it's not a recession because employment is still strong. 
And in typically in a recession, you have like this kind of like regression in the, un- in the employment numbers. But they didn't see it. Okay, but why didn't they not see it? And the second thing you have to understand about this is really is this is just a distorted metric. You can manipulate this number left and right. So it's not a real indicator of strength. It's a distorted metric. And I want you guys to really understand that because it's key to understanding how they project economic strength versus objective economic strength on the other side of that, on that face. Yeah, so, you know, we're going to pull up some charts here because there's a lot to talk about, particularly how it's related to jobs and how jobs are tied into interest rates and how they're being used. We're also going to talk about what sectors we really like. And I think we're also going to talk about where we think Bitcoin is going right. because everybody wants to know what that, where, where that, yeah. where, where that's going. So um, your best friend when you're investing is history and charts mm-hmm. because the chart tells you everything. No matter what the news says, no matter what mainstream media is talking about, go look at the charts. If you understand how to read it, because anybody can do it. If you understand what's happening in the charts, you can actually forecast what is happening, right? And I think I really want to start with this chart, Nick, because this is the bank. It's chart. um, it's a really, it's a really interesting piece of history that we really took a deep dive in, um, and whatever usually comes back down always has a reversion back to the mean, right? That's just the law of averages, and this is how these things work, right? So, you know, maybe you want to talk about this because we saw what happened with Silicon Valley Bank with FTX. We saw Pacific Bank. These are all regional banks, by the way, in the U.S. They're crumbling right now, but, like, as a trade, they could be an interesting opportunity. Again, this is not investment advice. But but you saw last year, we had three of the most, uh, three of the largest banks in America go through a failure. Um, But it's just so... This is key. So if ever you guys want to see more on this specific chart, I got this chart from Heresy Financial's channel on YouTube. Really cool guy. A lot of macro. Really good. So just to give a little context, this is the past. So this is the past versus the current future, uh, present right now. So if you look, if, if you can zoom in on the chart or any way or you see from this, this just look, 2005, 2006, you had no bank failures. It was completely um, dead. Then from going in 2007, uh, 2007, 2008 is when you start new, you had that financial crisis in America. And this is when you get an explosion in total assets uh, kind of going into uh, the bank failures and the total assets in those bank failures. So you see that spike starting 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and then it starts coming back down. And then if you get right here to 2021, 2022, it's also at zero again. And it's similar to the pre- uh, kind of the precondition of what happened in the 2007 period. And if you look at 2022, you're starting to see the uptick again, 2023. But if you look at that green line that goes up, those th- few banks that failed last year, way th- in terms of assets, way over exceeded what happened in 2007, 2008. Yeah, so, so look, I mean, there's, there's a lagging imp- impact happening right now, especially exactly. with those assets. That debt line, right, that red line with bank failures, I mean, it would not be surprised to see that spike in the next couple months here. Exactly. Or a couple, of, let's give it, I don't want to be too aggressive oh. here, but like, you know, you're probably going to see some more bank failures going into next year. And the key a lot trend, of yeah, a on. lot of toxic assets are on these balance exactly. sheets right now, and that's something you got to pay attention to. Exactly. And the more you, t- the, another condition we have to worry about is the more you have bank chaos and bank problems, the more you put liquidity at risk. And the more you put liquidity at risk, the more the government is now at risk. And de- there's also deflationary risk involved with this. Again, puts the government at risk. So here's a thesis. There's a, like, there's a little thesis out there that we could take into account is if these problems do occur the way they might occur, you have the possibility that we're going down the CBD route here, the CBD CBDC. But the fact that the Federal Reserve might end up being swallowed up by the government to really have total control over the money supply. Yeah. Um, Again, just something to keep in mind. We're not predicting no, a bank is, crisis. But this but is just something to look for in the patterns. Exactly. This is just a yeah. pattern that we're seeing right now is this could probably start accumulating. Another thing to add, I don't think we talked about, uh, mortgages. How yes. many people have taken out mortgages over the last three and a half years to finance a new property? Um, here are 20% down. There's some programs in the U.S. now that say you only need 5% down. Um, these are people that are going to struggle with their cash flow. In Canada alone, the amortization, yeah. you're paying a fee that doesn't even cover the interest expense. You're paying for the amortization of the loan just, just, to, just to service it. So yeah, exactly. people's cash flows are getting obliterated right now. The, rea- the, the probability that people are going to go to market and try to sell their house now is a lot higher 
Especially and in I, Canada versus the, the uh, in America where they have long-term mortgages. So yeah. they don't, won't even want to sell because it's like they're stuck. If I sell and I buy something else, I got to buy it a double or triple yeah. the, the interest rate. So they probably won't even want to sell. Yeah. But and in Canada, here's the key is mortgages are more locked in for five years. And over the next two years, we have, what is it, 50 to $100 billion kind of coming up due? Well, well, well above that. And mm. um, I was talking to a, a, a mortgage manager at uh, National Bank. And um, I just asked her very bluntly. I said, listen, this is in Montreal. I asked her, I go, like, people are screwed next year. She, she, she laughed and said, well, you know, we've got a very significant portion of our book that's going to get refinanced. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, at what rate? They're like, it's got to be at a higher rate. So the question I have, and I don't know what the answer is, but does the Bank of Canada go back and say, we're actually going to start cutting rates? And this is probably going to be next summer, the end of next summer, I would say Q2, Q3 before that starts happening. So again, this is, this and is stuff also that's to add to that specific one for mortgages, you could end up seeing Canada kind of emulating the West, uh, America, and start to tell people they can roll over the mortgages into 15-year contracts, 30-year contracts. But by doing this, you kind of like long-term slaved your people. Because now you're- Well, it's free. a debt slave. Exactly. You just basically so all it is, a debt slave. is I'm going to reduce your payment on a monthly basis, but the amount you're going to owe and pay to us as the bank is actually going to be a lot greater because we've now dispersed it over 15 to 30 years. Yeah. Talk about just the jobs and just yeah. so people understand every jobs number that comes out has a very significant impact uh, on interest rates. Anytime a strong jobs number comes out, well, guess what? The Bank of Canada and the Fed, they're probably going to hold rates or they're going to have to increase rates. But right now, they're both trapped. And the reason for this is because Nick and I believe, and this is just a thesis, but you just have to look at the numbers. I think most of these job numbers are being manipulated. Yeah, exactly. So to give more weight into the, 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 the manipulation of job numbers is you have to take into account that one is how many people that were typically in pension that decide to come back to work because inflation and the cost of living has gone up. So this is one thing. So in reality, would you call that job strength if people have to go back to work? I wouldn't call that strength. I would call that more from an economic weakness standpoint, people have to go back to work when they didn't have to before. That's one. Two is how many people have to have to have are getting second jobs. So you have another chart here that we, well not a chart, but uh, exactly. So now you have a record uh, half uh, half a million people that are not working two full time jobs. So this is the first, and that there's for sure holes in that. So so hold on, I just want to take a step back. Th- think about that for a second. They've been talking about very strong job numbers mm-hmm. for the last two years. Exactly. And every time they've come out, it's always led to the Fed or the Bank of Canada to increase their rates because anytime there's a straw job market and, quote, consumers are spending money, that doesn't assume credit card debt, by the way, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't take this into account. So no. I actually saw this chart about a couple weeks ago, and it kind of blew me away because I'm just like, that means people... They're just spending it. their lives every single day working two time, uh, two two full time jobs, to get by, which means they're getting taxed. They got to pay taxes on that. Um, it it it's it's very alarming too. And then the other thing is when you go back to what's happened on the revised side. Yeah, like so this is where it gets it. Hold on, exactly this is where it gets up. really interesting. It's like okay, every time they talk about jobless, like jobs that have been created, right? Versus the revised amount. I think this is U.S. It's but Canada exactly. it's, Canada has always been similar in a way. But this is primarily U.S. There's always about a two to three month yeah. adjustment where they're like, oh, well, we screwed up. And I'm like, okay, there's total manipulation happening right now. And when gold and oil were basically selling off this week, that tells me, and that I think it tells you, Nick, too, is like the Fed and the BOC right now, they're, they're fucked. They're trapped. Right. So, and it's funny because, you know, like point in time, they'll give you a backward looking number. This is the, str- this is the employment number, but then a month, two months goes by and then they all oh, will be revised. Oh, we got to revise again. But by the time they come out with the actual number, nobody's paying attention to that anymore. Now they're paying attention to the new current market data. So in reality, all they're doing is they're just projecting a lie and then fixing it later. But by the time they fix it, you're not even paying attention to that anymore. Yeah, because everyone's so just con- distorted. Uh, exactly. And everyone's just concerned about, did I make my credit card payment? Exactly. Can I pay my rent? Like, that's just what's happening. And then think about this too, when it comes to employment is the central banks, they want to fight inflation. But the thing is, if they fight inflation too aggressively, then unemployment kind of increases. But this is where the two mandates come into place. You're stuck in the middle is you don't want to fight inflation too much and then cause unemployment to increase because then you lead down the path of deflationary period 
and deflation becomes a liquidity risk for the government and it becomes an issue in terms of tax revenues and capital gains. So these are, these are risks that they don't necessarily want to go after. Uh, so it's really key to understand that unemployment is not, ne- is not actually a metric of strength from an objective standpoint. Yeah. It's just a metric well, of strength for governments to validate what they're doing. Exactly. And like monetary policy, unfortunately, is it, it, it's theoretically it makes sense. But when you put it into practice as to what's happening right exactly. now, you, f- you try to fight inflation. We're not seeing 2% inflation anytime soon because there's been so much money printed into exactly. the system where you're kind of just like, how is this even sustainable, right? Exactly. So, so it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle. So when Nick's talking about the Fed and, and the BOC are trying to fight inflation, well, theoretically what that means is they're going to have to increase rates a little bit higher to, quote, fight inflation. They want to slow down the economy, but it's a, it's a dual-edged uh, sword because they don't want to slow it down too much that it, pr- that it impacts liquidity and it impacts revenues for the government while they're incurring record debts. So just to give you guys another little, like, kind of like, macro framework in terms of American debt in the United States. So the American debt is, you have things like one, is the national debt, okay? So the national debt is at a record $33.7 trillion. The last six uh, weeks alone in America, they incurred $700 billion. So in about, so they're doing about $1 trillion per two months. So if you look at next year, they could theoretically incur another $5, 6000000000000 trillion of debt, which would bring them close to $40 trillion by the end of 2024. So that's just one little metric. Then we've got other little details, things like, for example, uh, global debt also hitting record highs of $307 trillion. Then you also have household uh, uh, debt hitting a, a record is $17.29 trillion. You have auto loan credit hitting a record high of $1.6 trillion. That's in the U.S., though. And that's in the U.S. Yeah. And this is dangerous, too, because as interest rates go up, a lot of these people are getting destroyed on every angle. So that's that. And then you also have credit card debt. In America, that's also hit a record high of $1.08 trillion. So when people say employment is strong, also ask yourself this question. To what extent is debt sustaining this strength? And then you ask yourself, is debt truly a, a way to establish economic strength? Objectively, no, it's not. But debt is what we use to just or kind of create this illusion right. of economic strength. Yeah, and that's, I think you have to read Ray Dalio's principles to just fundamentally understand like this is a service debt oriented economy, the West, exactly. right? It's not a precious metals driven commodity. It's not a bartering system. So when you create a society that's so dependent on credit to just survive, exactly. well, this is what happens. And exactly. it doesn't co- it, d- it doesn't even come in the form of the individual. Now it comes from government bureaucrats who claim that, and I'm quoting Janet Yellen here, the United States can afford to finance another <laughs> war. My head exploded. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you, you've been funding Ukraine. You've been funding the, uh, the, ta- the t- Taiwan for this. And now we, you got to go in and you got to fund the Israelis too. So it's like, it, it's just, it's honestly, it's, it's lunacy right now. And this is something that unfortunately is just, it's just not sustainable. Exactly. And, and Canada too. I mean, Canada's numbers, it's, it's obviously not as big, but it's the same velocity and the same exactly. growth trajectory. You and know, understand interest rates, put all these, you know, record highs of when it comes to debt. Well, yeah, Cause you got to service it's it. All that yeah. risk, debt at risk because you have to service it. And as the interest rates yeah. go up, the, the, the liability of that debt increases. So this is typically why you'll see in like financial markets is high interest rates means that PE multiples tend to come down. So, you know, it goes, ties in back to that. So the thing is, this is very key to understand because this indicates a potential shift in monetary cycles and global uh, economic powerhouses. And the thing is, when all this starts potentially deflates, if it does, let's go into a potential scenario. Well, then the matter is who has the least deflationary cycle and who comes out of it Mo, uh, the best to make sure that it doesn't totally collapse them or kind of remove them as a super ha- as an economic powerhouse. Yeah, and uh, so to kind of just you know wrap up the the interest rate talk, um, I think next year you're going to see uh, cuts in rates, exactly. but it's not going to have the quote unquote theoretical impact that I think you know politicians and macroeconomists think it's going to have. Exactly. I think you're going to have. Unfortunately, on, especially on the housing side, you're going to have people panic sell, uh, you know, at the top of the market. Like I, I've got a few, few brokers now who are trying to just sell their, their houses because they know that this is the top of the market. They've paid off the mortgage. And they it's might just cash. a little too late already. Exactly. So, and it, we're seeing the Toronto housing bubble kind of yeah, go exactly. through. So I think going into next year, if you really want to talk about, you know, monetary policy and the tightening cycle, like 
I think by Q2, Q3 next year, we'll probably start seeing rate cuts. Exactly. And now, so that's why ignore, you have to fundamentally ignore what the central banks say. Yeah. Fundamentally ignore what the government says, because what they say is a backward looking statement. It is never. It a always has been, by statement. the way. Yeah. Look at inflation, what happened in 2020. Okay. They lowered, they collapsed rates because they closed the economy. By the way, which was one of the dumbest things that we've done in the 21st century. They closed the economy, they collapsed rate, and they say, households, businesses, do not worry. We will not be raising interest rates for a long time. They lied. But they lied. Within a year, it was already, they the inflation lied. was going up, and they had they to lied. start raising interest rates. How many people bought houses at near zero interest rates? And, now, and especially in Canada, when you have a five-year uh, fixed mortgage, now they're like, oh, shit. If I renew, I'm now paying three times the interest rates. But they said they wouldn't raise. It's because you trust the people that fundamentally are not there to give you objective data. They yeah. are there to project uh, an illusion. So I, I'm going to make a friendly chirp here to uh, <laughs> mortgage brokers. Um, you need to understand what the two-year note is. You, you need, need to understand, to understand what it, what, how it moves. You need to understand the tenure. If you don't understand that, if you're talking to a mortgage broker or a real estate agent, they have no fundamental understanding of that. They're not in it for you guys. Exactly. And I got a lot of real estate friends. They actually agree with this statement. That's why most they're of them are focusing. People. They want you to they're, buy they're, in the moment. They're, they're, they're more focused on rentals right now. But if you're going to work with somebody like that and they don't have a fundamental understanding about how interest rates work, find another person or just hold on to exactly. it. Again, not investment advice. And guys, <laughs> another little key detail that I kind of forgot to neglect is... In America specifically, and this is hap this is gonna this is the the numbers are not as significant when Canada, but it's still a it's still a metric that is relevant to Canada, but it's in own terms. But I'm just gonna talk about America because obviously the numbers are much larger and it has a much bigger global impact. So if you look over the next 75 years in USA taxpayers, um, so over the next 75 years, US taxpayers have nearly. Do we have a chart for this or no? No. Okay. But this is uh, have uh, nearly 80 trillion dollars in long term unfunded obligations and 95 of that is related to social security and medicare oh yeah you're so, talking about the pension crisis so the yeah. key to understand about <laughs> this so this is again back to liquidity problem yeah. because they have things they got to pay and interest rates cannot take them away from that ability so this is why again i go back to the liquidity component liquidity is key because when you make a lot of promises and you're trying to kind of disperse yourself across the world and trying to control everything, liquidity is key because you do it through the money supply. And this is why governments always want to control over the money supply because it's the only way they can do what they're going to do. So the key to understand is that you have a, in the West and Europe in general, you have a massively aging population. What a ton of, and all of these people have been promised money by the governments. So there's, there's something you're talking. To, yeah, you're talking about baby boomers who've basically worked their entire life to this to pension. basically get into these pensions, which and is basically just like a massive Ponzi scheme, which is <laughs> piled on through debt servicing and taxes. And like they're at a fort like this is we're talking about a very big portion of the population here. Right. It's not the super wealthy, the entrepreneurs, the guys who have done exceptionally well, like th they'll be fine. It's more like the general that the middle class that's kind of go going yeah, into retirement. I, exactly. Like they, they are at a position right now where if you're not protecting any of your assets, and this exactly. is why I love gold and silver so much, because at the end of the day, hard assets. it's a hard asset. Rick Rule had a great quote. He's a listener. He's, he's, a, he's been a guest of ours. He had a great quote about why you want to own gold. And I'm quoting him here. He goes, I don't want to own gold for the sake of it going to 2200. I want it to own gold for the fear of it going to 6,000 because if that does happen and that, you know, again, that market is very manipulated, but it, it's a very awesome quote to just keep in the back of your mind. You want to have protection in this market and you know, you leave your retirement decisions up to government. Yeah, you're screwed. You're fucked. Look what happened in France uh, at the beginning of this year. They were promised retirement at what, 63 ish or words. And then they said, no, government came out saying, well, we can't service the pension. We got to increase we have all it. this debt now. We got to increase it to it by another two years. What so happened ridiculous. in Paris? A massive amount of protests in the street. Yeah. But why? Because people have delegated financial responsibility for their future Correct. to the government who then takes that money and puts it out there in the world for their insanities. Yeah. But the thing is, Funding wars. It's, like, it's like a Ponzi scheme. Then when it's time to pay everybody out, they can't pay. Yep. So they have to increase. And it's not just that's there. Like, They're done in Canada. They're going to do it everywhere. That, that, that's like going to a bank and you've got like, I don't know, a fifty thousand dollars just in a checking account you go to the bank and you're like can i withdraw my money and they say no we can't you need to put a money order in like that's just how the system works i get that but in from a wealth and sovereignty perspective it's like give me my money like exactly. what are you doing anyway um so yeah this let's let's move on to uh 
what sector I think is going to do exceptionally well this year. Yep. And um, oil and gas, guys, I honestly, regardless of whether oil trades at, you know, if WTI ever drops below 70, like these, these companies are making so much money. And I think obviously, I mean, if you go back in time, everyone's an expert after the move, right? But when we saw oil dip, what was it? Negative 39 on April 20th, 2020. I remember that day so well. There was like um, 45 cents. At the that station. was probably the best time to buy oil and gas stocks because you, you're up a fortune right now. Mm. I bought a handful. Full disclaimer, it's around 52% of my portfolio. And the key is cash and flow. It, and the key is cash flow because exactly. these things are paying dividends here. The crazy part is when you look at sort of the energy stocks versus the S&P, relative to their valuation, right? They've actually rebounded from their all-time lows. And if you see that dotted red line, there's still more upside. Exactly. And the reason for that is because these inventories that these oil and gas producers have, they're, ver they're, they're declining. Exactly. So remember when, when, for example, Christian Schneeland, our Minister of Finance in Canada, says the fight against inflation is we're winning it, it <laughs> wait a second, that's a backward look, that's a present statement looking at your current distorted CPI numbers of inflation without looking at what's happening into the future. What is occurring currently in the market that's going to indicate an upside in price? So oil going back up here, you're just putting, you're just creating another pressure on prices around the world. So in inflation- You're talking about oil, oil like WTI yeah, exactly. or you're talking about oil, oil stocks, like oil No, no, I'm talking about the oil pri the price of barrels. So price of uh, like WTI, price of barrels. So if well, not that, but I'm just in general. If price of barrels go up, it puts upward pressure on prices globally. Right, but that so that what Nick's talking about is something called demand destruction. But you know, Eric Nuttall, who's a very well known energy analyst up in Toronto, um, he's been an oil and gas bull since 2020, and the reason for that is because there's been an absolute like decline in the amount of inventory that's available for a lot of these producers. And then you just put a simple supply and demand equation. Okay, demand is not going away anytime soon. No, exactly. Everybody who's calling for this demand that. destruction, again, this is just my opinion, this is an actually financial advice. This demand um, destruction, destru th th this demand destruction, I think is a hoax of because is, yeah. no one's gonna stop flying, no one's gonna stop driving. We need hydrocarbons in everything that we use. One of these here for all the TikTok influencers. If you like, want to electrify the world, the, the primary input is oil because oil is what allows you to then get the commodities out of the ground. So it's all agricultural commodities and resources. You need oil to get commodities out of the ground. Commodities come out of the ground and then they go around the world. Yeah. That entire infrastructure, that entire ecosystem is dependent on oil. Yeah, like ships, ships need gas to, to get around the world. You want so like trucks, you're not, you want mines. You, you, want, you, you want, want your want, Amazon package. You want to you know? electrify <laughs> the world. How much more, you, they, 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 they stay on estimated as four or five, six times the amount of commodities required. That entire ecosystem runs on oil. Yeah. You want to electrify, oil goes up in demand. You can't have it without the other. It's, yeah. just a, it's, a, it's a lie and, and, and it's a misunderstanding of how the world works. And, and we're seeing it now in Germany, right? With these wind turbine projects that have caused total damage to wildlife. I mean, birds are literally flying into them. They're dying they're and, not they're, efficient, and they're not efficient. They're not providing enough power. There's no, if you have no wind, you have no power. Solar, if you have no sun, you have no power. If you live in the United States below the sun belt, okay, and they fine. Have, and they don't have any ways to store energy either. C correct. That's vanadium, but we'll talk about that after we already talked about it. Um, the, uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, I, I, Nick and I keep laughing when we see these oil and, like these climate activists protesting that they're going to stop using oil. Okay, if you're going to stop using oil, stop videotaping yourself on your Instagram and stop taking Snapchats and stop using the computer that you're going to use to quote unquote write your journal about how unhappy you are. Yeah, stop, it, stop virtual signaling. Exactly. It, it's what fundamentally to understand is if you're going to solve a problem, if you don't understand the problem, then you're not solving nothing in this we're, world. We're veering off here. I want to <laughs> keep going. But back to the oil, just quickly on the oil is, yeah, understand the problem or else you're not solving anything. So you don't want to fight oil. You want to understand oil, why it's needed, and how it produces this world. Yeah. And then you can evolve and innovate based off of that understanding. So here's another chart. This is mainly Canadian oil and gas producers, mainly oil producers. At 90 WTI, this is the free cash flow yield, okay? Everything above that line is 
every single producer of natural gas and oil in Canada is generating so much free cash flow that they're actually able to pay out a dividend. You want to have That's some cheap. exposure into here. ESG portfolio managers, wake up. You probably do not have any clients left if that's all you've been focusing on because your job is to generate alpha for your clients and this is a great sector right now that's going to be able to do that for you so understand with everything we've highlighted in terms of a risk standpoint from a macro standpoint the point is as an investor when you're trying to focus on preserving your wealth because remember key is preserving wealth is the most component is the most difficult thing to do making money is one thing preserving is difficult as hell but when you're dealing with this geopolitical risk and the way the, the world is shifting and changing as it is and at an exponential rate you want to get defensive while also seeking alpha. But the thing is, get defensive. And the thing is, natural resources like this that pay great cash flows and great yields that are sustainable, these are defensive you, plays. Yeah, you just you just want to be careful, though, to make sure that any of these producers that you're going to look at, like, just a make... Sustainable ju a sustainable output. Well, hold on, let me finish, bud. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nick loves talking about this stuff. That's why I like doing this with them. Um yeah, like just the debt levels, you got to pay attention to that. If if debt is pro if if their debt is more than forty percent, I'd be a little bit cautious. But you know, I'm just seeing some names here. There's like Pado Exploration. They're more of a natural gas company. Uh, Tourmaline's done really well. Um, I own uh, I've I've owned Surge Energy, SGY, Pipestone. I made you know bought that during the COVID lows. So like, there's probably some upside here. Again, not investment advice, but these companies. At $70 WTI, they're still making money. Yep. And I was talking to a few of these CEOs, and they basically said, we actually don't want oil to go above $92 a barrel because then that creates more yep. complexities yep. with demand. We're actually very comfortable at this range. So in a way, when oil is falling off here at 75 bucks, good opportunity in my Plus, opinion. Plus, usually typically going into winter, yep. oil and the natural gas tend to go up in price. You got it, man. And we're right there. Yeah. So. Um, let's keep going here. We got a couple more charts here and then we'll talk about Bitcoin and crypto. We saved the best for last, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this is a chart of the TLT. TLT is the, uh, 20 year treasury bond in the United States. As you can see, it's totally collapsed. You had a head and shoulders at the top. Uh, it's broken through two resistance or support levels and now it's even trading lower. What this tells me with everything going on globally, I would not be surprised to see a rally in bonds next year. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is a rate cut, right? When you have TLT trading where it's at, I mean, I saw it trade down almost to $82 US. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, to really hedge in this market. Um, again, talk to your advisors. I'm not a portfolio hey guys, remember manager. This. When rates go down, it's not because of a good thing. It's because because of a bad thing. Correct. So that it's fundamental. That's why like gold's going to go up. You don't lower rates because, yeah. well, we, we want to we want to make things better. No, 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 no. Even if it might appear like it's going to help relieve some problems in the short term, the long term consequences are drastic, and we keep pushing the can down. Yeah. Eventually, that can can't be pushed any further, and you get a total implosion. Yeah. So and history's on our side for that statement. I mean, every chart that you look at is is basically telling you the same thing. But yeah, like this just wanted to throw this in here because this is sold off so aggressively that going into next year, it almost backs up a rate cut into the middle part or the end, end part of 2024. So yeah, something to keep in mind. Um, let's keep going. We save the best for last. Whoops. Let me, let me pull this up here. All right. No, that's not it. There we go. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Oh my God. The price move. So it's very relevant with the I price move that we yeah, just this is very interesting what's going on. And um, you know, if we go back to 2021, massive breakout to the upside there at the 16,000 level. By the way, this is in US dollars. I think Canadians trading at like 50k or 52k. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we saw what was probably the most insane upside rally I think in any asset class other than maybe natural gas back in the day. So Bitcoin hits an all-time high at 66,000 or 67,000 and everyone's saying, Bitcoin's going 100K, you got to buy more. Anytime I hear that, I laugh because that is the psychology in the market saying now's probably the time Remember, to get they out. they did that in 2021. What happened? Yeah, and then you saw it basically implode and then yeah. now we're kind of back to, I mean, look, that 16,150 is a very important support line because that was the, it's just basic technical analysis here, guys. 
that was the first leg to the upside, and then now it bounced back out. So if you actually were following this very closely, a 16,000 entry on Bitcoin was amazing. Nice move. It's amazing. So what have we seen in the last... It's been the best performing asset class, right? Um, there's more upside there. Now, I'm going to draw a comparison in a moment, but I just want people to understand something. Bitcoin has an opportunity to go to 47,000 right now, yeah. just based on this chart. Look at it very simply. You draw the support and resistance lights, excuse me, because that was the last time we had a breakdown to the downside, and that was also the last time we broke and got up to the all-time high, right? So over the last eight months, there's been an accumulation here, and BlackRock has been quoting and trying to get this Bitcoin ETF running to come into the marketplace, which the SEC is not approved. They're giving yet. a little resistance because, again, it's a competition. It, it's, it's an asset class that kind of starts dealing with the money supply and currencies and yeah. fiats. And so, so the question I have is, okay, if you're going to try and fulfill the demand for this ETF, what does the price of Bitcoin have to be? Probably 200000 And the point is also, here's a key. So you got to fulfill, it's supply and demand at the end of the day. But here's also a key we understand is people that support these institutions creating ETFs, if you look in the gold community, most of the people in the gold community despise gold ETFs because it's kind of like a fractional way. It distorts the reality of the price of gold. It doesn't allow real demand to kind of enter the, the ecosystem. So same thing with Bitcoin. You might want to support it, but the thing is, does it create some sort of fractional where for every dollar you put in, it only owns 10% in terms of Bitcoin. So is there a fractional distortion that could occur if we have support of ETFs? I personally don't. I don't like ETFs that that delegate response or that say we'll take care of responsibility for these so-called assets. But in reality, you're not really helping the demand side of these ecosystems. No, because it's just paper that's being created. Exactly. It's, it's not paper. an actual... Like, so gold ETFs, I would say not get it if you're going to do something more like Sprott or buy it yourself. Same thing with Bitcoin. You're better off getting something that has a real exposure that's yours than buying into an ETF. Yeah, like I, I personally own like Bitcoin on my CoinSquare account. And the best part would be to have two or three Bitcoin but in the next in, five years. But to it's, 10 it's years. yours. It's not through a, a third party that, that has some sort of paper trail. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, like going back to this chart, like, again, the thing that's going to probably move it to the upside is if the SEC comes out and says we've approved the ETF. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they get all the money all the dumb money starts coming in because the smart money has been accumulating well below, exactly. I would say, 30,000. 30, so this is where it comes into a potential liquidity trap. Yeah. And this is where the psychology, if you don't understand how charts really move up, and it doesn't matter what or the asset the psychology class is. of the market. It yeah, doesn't exactly. matter what the asset class says, by the way. You're going to probably see a huge resistance on 47,000. And then probably a liquidity trap where they exactly. just start dumping it. But again, yeah, because I think that for if you if we look from a psychological standpoint, I think from a psychological standpoint, the downside back to the 16k mark from that support barrier, let's say 47, is Resi much more resistance. Yeah, so is much more plausible than a move upside to the 100k line. I just don't see the psychology in the market. Not yet, at least. Exactly. I, I, and I will say this. I think we both agree that at some point, Bitcoin will get to 100,000. It's just... It's just from a technical standpoint is yeah. when I want to enter. I don't want to enter at top of a move. I want to get in at where I know there's a, p a very good well, bottom potential. Full disclaimer, I was buying around the 28, 29,000. So... Exactly. Pretty, I was waiting happy. for... I My thesis still... I'm still going for the 10, 13K mark. I was close but I didn't get in at the 16. That's that's like such a good segue to the next chart, but go <laughs> ahead. But yeah, for me, it's personally, it was more, I think there's still a downside because of everything going on. And if they if they create this liquidity trap where they're trying to build up a lot of momentum to go down hard on the price, then again, the 16K mark could become a place to a start your entry point and even 10K could be a Six, real possibility. 16, not 60. Oh, 16, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, one six. Bad, um, no, it's a good segue into the last chart here because... I'm going to give a special shout out to my guy down in Florida because this guy's been following this stuff daily. Um, Bill, if you're watching, this one's for you, man. I wanted to throw this in here because it's almost like the correlation is insane. And um, what I'm about to say is going to sound very crazy. People are going to probably listen to this episode and be like, Dan is actually a lunatic and that's fine. I am a lunatic, so I'll, I'll take that. But it's also, but just before you go... Remember, this is still relatively a newest chart that's only about, what, 12 years old, 13 years old. So we're still, there, there's still a process of trying to establish patterns and correlating movements to kind of foresee where possible outcomes can occur. So here's what you have to understand, okay? 
where is the smart money getting all of this money to help fund what's happening in the world, right? Who are the big players? Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, maybe? But I'm really just focused on those two, Vanguard and BlackRock. They control all these markets. They own pretty much every company in the S&P 500. The TQQQ, which is the triple NASDAQ leverage to the upside, is a very interesting chart to take a look at because what it does, first of all, it's three times beta of the NASDAQ, right? The second thing is if you actually draw a correlation to it, it's very correlated to Bitcoin. It's almost identical. It's almost like 80 to 90% correlation to Bitcoin. And... What's happened is with all the liquidity splashing around to help, quote unquote, because they got to fund this war somehow. They're not just printing out more money at this point. They can't do that, right? You keep printing out more money, you're going to have more inflation. They're trying to reduce inflation. So where are they? You have to ask yourself the question, where are they getting that money? Where are they getting all that liquidity to continue to fund this so-called war that's happening or these conflicts globally? So there's been a massive rotation into these names where if you draw a correlation from the TQQ to Bitcoin, you could actually have a five to six month forecast of the price of Bitcoin. And if you go, if you zoom in on this chart, if you go to like April 27, 2023, and you draw the next five months after, it's about 145 days, trading days. Um, this chart is telling me that Bitcoin is actually going to go to 46,000 before capitulating down. And I think there's this, this, this chart was taken uh, about a week ago. So it's actually, you, you saw... Free, really, but it doesn't include this current weekly move. I, I, exactly. So you got to ask yourself the question. It's like, okay, where is the money flowing? Where, is the, where are the institutional buys coming in? The biggest names on uh, the New York Stock Exchange and the, and, the, uh, and the NASDAQ right now that are getting all this liquidity. You have the Magnificent Seven, Apple, uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, or Meta it's called, um, et cetera. And you've got Tesla in there as well. Well, guess what? There's other names that are moving very aggressively and that have a lot of liquidity when exactly. Bitcoin starts moving. Riot and Mara, okay? These names, there's all this liquidity that's trapped in, this chart, in these charts. They got to rotate in and out, in and out, in and out. And again, this is not a projection, but this is just my opinion. But this goes back into but, also the thesis of our melt up. But exactly. So, you know, they got to find a way to help fund these wars. How do they do it? They go into the markets, they play all these charts, and then they can actually predict the future. And I got to give a shout out to my buddy, Bill Matthew, uh, who's down in uh, Florida right now, if you're, if you're watching. Um, this guy's been wired to the charts and he's been sharing this information for, t with me. And I've got another confirmated source down in Texas as well, who's basically saying like, this is literally part of the plan, which we won't talk about. But if you're really paying attention, you understand. But this is all this liquidity coming into these rotations right now. So, you know, you uh, crypto's got momentum right now. And if you want to get some form of exposure, the altcoins are really interesting too, because there's about a two to three day la uh, lag before they actually all rip to the upside too. So, so, yeah. so as we're talking again, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but if you really study these charts and you really follow the movement of these candles on a daily basis, you can actually see this with your own eyes. Yeah. This is all happening. You just got to dig deep. And again, it's public information. So typically let's, so let's go back to this idea of a melt up. So, it, having to do with what you're seeing now. So the earnings came out this week. We saw a potential upward move and people are starting to see, okay, well, like if you look on social media, on Facebook groups and uh, f uh, stock platforms, stuff like that, a lot of people are kind of getting excited again because they think, they say, okay, well, rates are paused. Markets, earnings are good. Employment is strong. So the economy is strong. So, well, things are still have a, a lot of upside. So people are kind of getting back in. So this goes back into the liquidity trap that, you've been that you kind of highlighted before where you have this correlating move where typically uh, Bitcoin has been uh, correlated to kind of like tech and risk on asset. So you have this behavior where people kind of going back in now and precisely to the liquidity trap is they're baiting everybody back into the market where they can then create a massive liquidity opportunity where they can make a ton of money to the downside just as rates start coming back down. But at that point, people are going to officially, because now you're going to see twice, central banks and government pivot on their monetary policy, on their monetary perspective within the span of two or three years. And that's going to cause a real shock to the system. Yeah, and that's when I really think you want to own gold and silver because that's when you see aggressive moves. Again, back to that Rick Rule quote. I mean, it's a perfect example of why you actually want to own some of that exactly. stuff. But look, crypto momentum is here. 
Um, we are I would opportunistic uh, investors. If, if 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 you have, if you know how to manage risk, if you want to take advantage of this momentum opportunity, it's here. Um, I'm taking advantage of it. I told you at the beginning of the show. I was like, yeah, I bought a little bit more crypto this morning because there's going to be more upside. Um, and again, not investment advice, but um, it, it's something that I just find so fascinating because a couple of years ago, you and I were basically saying I would never own Bitcoin, but having conversations with people and understanding how liquidity is flowing in and out of the market, you actually want to have some form of exposure it's a, it's into a this asset class. exposure. Exactly. You, you, you spread your risk out and then you build your portfolio in a way that adapts and accommodates market conditions and global conditions. If you're all in freaking tech, you're 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 completely exposed to the downside move of the world. Yeah, completely especially now. Completely exposed, especially now. So yeah, so it's a it's we we will talk about all kinds of asset classes, but it's because we like to expose ourselves to as many different things that we know can protect us, defend us, and give us alpha return. Yeah. So to recap, um, it's very simple. The jobs numbers we feel like they're being manipulated, um, like everything else, government. Like 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 everything else that the government is is touching. Um, that's going to cause a little bit of a shock in, when interest rates start coming down. Um, oil and gas is a very investable sector right now, exactly. regardless of what the media As is a telling you. Standpoint, you I mean, get it's the free, politics out of the way. Yeah, if you if you get the politics out of the way, there's free cash flow that's just being generated there. Um, bonds, long term bonds, are most likely going to rally, and that's going to cause rates to come down. So when you see the two year on both Canada and the U.S. start coming down, you can anticipate a rate cut. And then, look, I think crypto going into this winter, man, is just going to be it's going to be a fun asset. Going just manage risk to, yeah. accordingly, and you exactly. can make a, a good amount of coin doing that. Just be careful not to get caught buying into something at a high point with a lot of downside exposure. So if you're going to get in at these current price levels, make sure you try to cover your downside a little bit. Nick's just a little bit more conservative when it comes to crypto. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm not. He's not. Not that I much wait, of a cowboy I wait, like I am. Because in the, I know the moves, especially <laughs> when it comes to crypto. I know the moves are much more volatile, so I don't mind waiting for s- bottoms because it's a matter of patience. You know, I originally got in at ten, sold it at fifty, went up to seventy-five. This is in Canadian terms. I went seventy-five. This was like two and a half years ago, and I still haven't bought back in because I'm waiting for a real bottom. I guess I didn't. Nick's call not a trader like I am. Exactly. So <laughs> swing trades. <laughs> Um, yeah, before we, we, we hop off here, um, we just wanted to give a special thank you and a shout out to a lot of people who've been listening. Um, it's been an awesome journey just getting our voices out there because there's a lot of noise in this marketplace. Um, and, um, if you're in Montreal, we're hosting an event. Uh, so November 30th, uh, in downtown Montreal, we're going to have three companies come. It's going to be an investor gathering because, the most common question that we've been getting is, you know, how do you guys, you know, Nick and Dan, where do you guys keep finding these investment ideas? And the simple answer is we go talk to these CEOs and we go meet them. So we've built a really nice community and network that we want to kind of allow our ecosystem and our network to tap into that. You gotta get that word kind of out of your vocabulary. But anyway, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just fucking with you. Um, Uh, But yeah, like the, the idea is really to bridge that gap between people our age and what other investment opportunities out there. Cause the reality is private equity deals, uh, private debt deals, unless you've got a net worth of over five or $10 million, no, uh, it's very tough to get exactly. in front of. So this is, this is yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. And a shout out also to black box media for this, uh, for our setup there. So um, yeah, it's cool. It's they're nice. going to be a partner of ours here with these in studios. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. There's nothing else to add. We're going to have more guests on, We're excited for what we're doing. We're excited for this event. And uh, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed listening to us on the New Gen Mindset Podcast. Ciao, guys. Take care.